everyone, seemingly everyone, has kind of a similar profile. There's close to 1,500 people here. Okay, raise your hand if you've done shadowing. Okay, hands go up. Raise your hand if you've done research. Hands go up. How about uh, volunteering? Raise your hand, you know, and a lot of hands would be going up, right? That is Christian Essman. And for nearly 20 years, he served as the Senior Director of Admissions for the Top 25 Medical School, Case Western. Today, you'll hear from some of the most competitive schools in the entire nation, including Case Western, Yale, and Columbia. All of these ad comms will tell you that the secret to getting into medical school is do what you love. Now, what exactly does doing what you love mean? Today, I'm here to translate that ambiguous do what you love into four exact simple steps that anyone can follow. Passion turns to time, turns to skill, turns to impact. I'm Mike. I'm an anesthesiologist in New York City and I'm the co-founder of Pre-Med Catalyst. I went to UCLA for undergrad and trained at UCLA for medical school. And over the last seven years, I've helped hundreds of pre-meds get into their dream medical schools. But normally we get a little over 4,000 applications for normally 64 seats. Yes, some classes are 66, 67, but normally 64 students a little over 4,000 applications. So it is competitive. You need to be the best applicant you can be. But honestly, Melissa, there is no perfect formula. There is no, if you do this, then you can guarantee to get in. So my advice, advice is be the best applicant you can be. Look, it's no surprise that in today's medical school admissions, you have to stand out to earn your seat. In recent years, UCLA has had 13,122 applications and every year they have round about 173 seats. Of course, it's a very difficult and competitive numbers game, and on that front, I agree. What I do not agree with is that there is not a specific formula. I think there is. Here's Dr. Jeffrey Suhu, the Assistant Dean of Admissions at the University of Colorado. I also see applicants sometimes that are what I call well unbalanced, where they've really excelled in one particular area, whether it be you know research or community service, um, and they've really thrown their whole selves into that. Did you catch what Dr. Suhu said about being well unbalanced? It's these pre-med students with the spike or the standout factor or something exceptional about them that really catches the eyes of your admissions committee members. For example, if you started Khan Academy or you built a computer lab to help the incarcerated get college degrees, those things stand out. And it's these exceptional pre-meds that get into the nation's top medical schools. Take a look at Columbia, for example, a top five, top 10 medical school, and how this student describes his student body. The people who are at Columbia are just tremendous. They are in, in this incredibly diverse group from all walks of life with all kinds of experiences. And I've learned so much from all my other peers who were Olympic athletes and you know, uh, who worked in finance and who had jobs for 10 years or a journalist. Doing things outside of medicine makes you better in medicine. So if we come to this agreement that standing out can be reverse engineered or there is a formula to success, the question now is what is that formula? We know what standing out looks and feels like. The University of Colorado calls it well and balanced. I call it world class. But right now, we don't know how to reliably get there. The Long School of Medicine in Texas gives us a clue. So the people who really um, stand out for us are people who've made a pretty substantial commitment. Like um, maybe they're a big brother, big sister. So under the topic of community service, they really have hearts of service, they want to serve, and they've done something long-term. Notice how Dr. Kellaway emphasizes commitment and time. Substantial experiences and impact are not built overnight. And Dr. Kristen Goodell from Boston University shares another crucial piece of the puzzle. And the most important thing is that people, is that you do what you are excited about not what you think is going to look good. I wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Goodell here. Passion is at the center of the formula. It is the thing that drives this entire flywheel forward. When you're passionate about something, you spend more time in it. And when you spend more time in something, you get better at it. And when you develop those skills, you make a larger impact. And it's no surprise that the things that we are best at, the things that we make the largest impacts in, are the things we are also more passionate about. And the flywheel turns around and around and around. Now, if this video has been helpful so far, I know you're going to love our application database. 
It's a full collection with every GPA, every MCAT, every personal statement, every extracurricular activity that has been submitted on behalf of eight successful now medical students and residents. You'll know exactly what it takes to get into schools like UCLA, UC San Francisco, and UC San Diego. In fact, you'll see the entire application that I submitted back in 2019 when I got into UCLA Medical School with no gap years. The resource will always be free in the link in our bio, and I'll see you over there. Now, back to the video. So if doing what you love is at the core of getting to medical school, let's talk about the passion flywheel. Also known as a positive feedback loop or a virtuous cycle, flywheels build on top of each other. And for pre-med admissions, the passion flywheel, you guessed it, starts with passion at the top. Now, if you're anything like me, you remember the piano lessons, violin lessons, viola lessons that you had as a kid and how much of a slog it was to do just 30 minutes of practice a day. And if you're anything like me, you also remember what it's like to play four, five, six hours of video games without ever needing to take a bathroom or a food break. The point here is that the things you are passionate about, you spend more time on, which is the next part of our flywheel. And the things you are less passionate about, you spend less time on. Carrying that piano video game analogy forward, the more time you spend on that video game, the better you get at it. You develop skill over time as you put more and more of your time invested into that craft. And when you get better at something, the accolades, the trophy, the victories, they all pile up. And what we call that in the flywheel is impact. And of course, the things that we have a lot of trophies in, the things we've won a ton in, we love because we're good at. Impact reinforces our passion for that thing. And you can see around and around and around we go flying through this flywheel again and again and again until the impact is so large, the passion is so large that you stand out to your dream medical school. So let's talk about where the passion flywheel breaks down. It starts at the level of the passion again. If you're not passionate about something, piano for me as a kid, you won't spend a lot of time in it. You won't really have that momentum, that activation energy to get through the initial friction that you need. So really the barrier between passion and time, I might say is activation energy or friction. You're just not passionate enough to spend enough time going through the motions. But let's say you do find something you're passionate about and you are willing to spend time in it. The gap between time and skill is opportunity. You can spend a ton of time doing something, but if the opportunity is not right, the extracurricular activity is not right, then you won't develop the skills that you need. Let me give you an example. A lot of pre-med students will spend three, four, five thousand hours as a volunteer at a hospital, a medical assistant at a clinic, and those become repetitive or repetitive, repetitive tasks. They're not really developing the skills that they need to stand out and make an impact. So the gap between time and skill is finding the right opportunity vehicle. For a student interested in working with children, it may start as being a medical assistant at a pediatrics clinic. It may then evolve to a different opportunity vehicle where you're doing basic science research on children blood-borne cancers. It then may evolve where you find another opportunity vehicle where you're working on public health research for food deserts, uh, helping children get fresh produce. Now, once you have the skill, you have the perspective, what would be the barrier between skill and impact? Really, that right there is focus or direction. If you do not have the correct direction or strategy, one may say, you could be focusing your skills and perspective to the wrong output. The classic example of this is a pre-med who uses all of their skills to found a club on campus that no one joins, no one else is interested in, and goes nowhere. Instead, that pre-med may use their skill and strategically direct it to a substance abuse clinic where they pioneer an HIV outreach self-testing program that hands out kits to members in the community, where they may take their expertise and join a basic science research lab and go across the country presenting novel genome sequencing work in monkeypox. These are two real examples from students in our mentorship program. Once you have the skill, you must have the strategy 
and the direction to know how to apply it to land the impact that you're looking for. And the barrier between impact and passion don't really exist. A lot of us uh, really enjoy the things we're good at and I've never really found any pre-med stuck there. So if you are able to have a significant impact, you can rest assured you'll continue to like what you're doing. So here is an example of a real positive flywheel in action. One of our pre-meds in our mentorship program, Betty, is interested in infectious diseases or ID. She uses that passion and spent some time in the basic science research lab where the skill that she developed was the scientific method, literature review, things of that sort. And off the back of that skill that she developed, she published a first author publication sequencing the monkeypox virus mutation. And that led her to become more interested in infectious disease, back to the passion, deepening the passion where she spent time abroad in countries like Bolivia and spent time shadowing real clinics and real hospitals specializing in global infectious diseases like Chagas. That skill, that perspective of knowing that population, understanding healthcare abroad, has not translated into impact yet, but I would bet that that information and perspective will turn into impact down the line. And around the flywheel we go again, her infectious disease basic science research and her infectious disease clinical shadowing abroad now led her to try and combine the two. She's now working in research with people, also known as clinical research. She's, she spent some time in a clinical research lab looking at HIV, hepatitis B co-infection in Africa, taking that literature review skill she developed from the first term and now is publishing even more work looking at the incidence of cirrhosis in Vietnam veterans who have hepatitis C. And around the fly will we go again. Even more interested in HIV and that specific sub-niche of infectious disease, she spent time on the street medicine outreach clinics becoming an HIV linkage counselor. The skill there is learning how to start a program, learning how to partner with the LA Department of Public Health, learning how to work with social workers, and see people in under-resourced communities. Thus far, she's been able to offer self-test kits to 30 plus unhoused individuals in the LA community. That is real impact. And again, the passion flywheel turns one more cycle around. Eventually, you make enough turns of this passion flywheel and you get an application that is so undeniably impactful and it is so clear what the passion of that pre-med is that medical schools must notice. That is the power of the passion flywheel. And that is how you take something that you love, something every admissions committee member loves saying, your passion, convert it to your time, use the time to leverage skill, use the skill to develop impact, and that impact makes you more passionate about the original thing. Make sure that the things that you're doing, you're actually passionate about, or else you won't overcome that activation energy. Make sure that you have the mentors to choose the right opportunity Otherwise, you won't develop the appropriate skills. And once you have the skills, think about the strategy and direction you want to take those skills so that you can actually create real impact in your application. That's the thing that matters. Not the passion. The passion is the thing that drives the flywheel. Every year, over 50,000 pre-meds apply to medical school and over 60% don't get into a single one. If this video hasn't been completely trashed thus far, I highly encourage you to take a look at the free resources we have in our description box below. Click the link in the description box to find out more. And for now, let's go back to the video. If this video has been helpful alone, I'd love the opportunity to work together. Pre-Med Catalyst actually started as a mentorship program where we help you take full control of your pre-med journey. We'll help you figure out your passion, your theme, and build a cohesive narrative. Most importantly, you'll always have a personal support system that will help you make the right decisions for your doctor dream. If you're interested, you can check us out in the link in our bio. It's titled Pre-Med Catalyst Mentorship Program. And if you liked this video on what adcoms believe the secret is to standing out, you'll love this video here where adcoms will tell you what does not stand out. And again, it features adcoms from some of the most competitive schools in the nation, including 
Boston University, University of Colorado, and Harvard. Now that you know what to do from this video, there's no better advice than learning what not to do from the actual people who make decisions on your candidacy. Again, that video is here and I'll see you over there.